Our learning objective here is specifically we're going to describe how the input and output values of a function vary together by comparing function values. So we're going to talk a lot about input and output. And we might not always use this terminology. In fact, as we go on, I won't use these words very often. I'll usually use domain and range. Question for you, domain. Do you think domain is the input or the output? Input, if you said input, you're correct. This is the domain, which means output must be the, the range. Okay, typically, variables are associated with domain and range. What do you think of when you hear domain? What variable is that usually? X. X, absolutely. This is usually the X variable. And range is described as Y. Y, you got it. Okay, so we're going to do that and we're going to construct a graph representing two quantities that vary with respect to each other in contextual scenario. All right. So let's get started. There's a lot of vocabulary words, but rather than go through it here, I'm going to start on this side and we'll see the vocabulary as we go. The first thing, now this is not on your packet. I ran out of the space and there were a couple slides that did not make it. This is one of them because this is only an illustration. Uh, what we're going to talk about here is the function. What a function is mathematically is it takes a set of inputs and creates an output. Now notice, what type of shapes are going in as inputs? Circles or spheres. And what's coming out? Cubes. Are they exactly the same? No, because what we're doing is we're going to perform type, some type of function that will change it. So, for example, let's just say our input was 3, 5, and 7. 3, 5, and 7 go in. Maybe what comes out is 15. Anybody want to guess the next one? 25 and, and 35. I'm running out of space all right there. 35. Now, what would be the function here? The function would be y equals x times 5, which I'm going to write as 5x. That would be the function. Does that make sense? So you have a set of inputs and you have outputs coming out. This would be the x, this would be the y, this would be the domain, this would be the range. So a function changes the inputs and makes them become the output. Um, this is describing the function rule. Now, as we go, uh, I'll just show you, rather than make you read the paragraph, this is on your notes, but rather than reading this here, I'm just going to explain it as we look at the situations. So the first thing we're going to do is identify the inputs or the independent. Independent is also input, which is, what do we say inputs the same thing as? The domain or the x. I'm not going to write x because it's not always an x. And dependent could also be the output or the range. And again, it doesn't have to be y, especially in real-world situations. We might use different variables. Right there. Okay. So again, I'm skipping over the real wordy slides because you can always read those later. I'll spend more time on the mathematical pages. So example one. Reached in a race situation, generate a function describing the independent and dependent variable and the possible units in which they are measured. Okay, here is our first example. Example 1a. The cost of an iPhone is a function of how much memory it has. Now, my first question for you is identify what are the two variables here? The iPhone. Not the cost and memory. Okay, so I've heard cost, I've heard iPhone, and I've heard memory. Those are the only three things I've heard. Two of them are correct, one of them's extra. What are the two actual variables? The two things that could change? Cost of memory. Cost of memory. No matter what, it's an iPhone. That's not changing. But what is going to change is the cost and the memory. Now, which one depends on the other? No, cost depends on memory. Cost depends on memory. So you might do something like this. Instead of using Y and X, so I, I can put Y here and I could put X. But I'm going to use the variable C and M. So here's how you would write this in math. You might say C of M. That's what the previous slide I skipped over. It says you read the C of M equals some function of X. Uh, now, depending on what X represents, you have some mathematical values. What do you think the cheapest iPhone is, cost-wise? Oh, I, I put X. I'm sorry. I messed up. I shouldn't have used X there. Well, mem uh, memory should be a M. 
So mathematically, uh, what do you think the cheapest iPhone might cost? Hey, Robert, I need you off your desk, please. Four hundred dollars. So maybe you'd have a plus four hundred. That would be the start, and then for every gig of memory, or every however many gigs, maybe the price goes up. So maybe you'd say, okay, this might be times five. This might be times ten. Something like that. That's how your equation would look. Okay. Uh, something generally like that. That's just an example answer. Example answer. Example answer. Now, I don't know exactly what the function would look like. You'd have to ask Apple what their value is, but that, that's how it would look. Okay, let's try a B and a C here. The time to fill a bathtub is a function of the rate of water that comes from the faucet. Okay, what is the independent? What is the dependent? So the time to fill it depends on the rate of the water, or does the rate of the water depend on the time? So if you're if you have your faucet open full blast, does it fill up fast or slow? Fast. If the faucet's on oh, barely open, fills up slow. The rate determines how much time it takes. So the time would be the independent or dependent? Dependent. So I'm going to put a Y here. And the rate of water, I'm just going to circle rate. Rate would be the independent, the X value. Now I'll use these variables. So I'm going to say T of the rate, T of R equals, and here's what's weird. Uh, it might be some certain amount of time, but uh, I'll write down the equation here. The rate, if the rate is high, it's going to be inversely related. What do I mean by that? If the rate is high, should the time be big or small? Small. If the rate is small, you need the time to be big. And so if this is inversely related, which means it would be dividing rather than multiplying. You know how, let me go back a slide. You see here we have a multiply by the variable? That's most situations in life. That's when they're directly related, is when you multiply by the variable. Indirectly is when you're dividing by it. That's when it goes backwards. So as the rate gets big, this makes time get small. As the rate is small, this makes time get big. That's how that equation would look. Now, you don't have to be able to come up with this right off the beginning of the day, but I do need you understanding what is the domain, what is the range. Okay? Uh, let's try one more here. Again, these are all example answers. This doesn't have to be the exact equation. The temperature of a broiler is a function of the amount of time it's heated. Temperature is the dependent, uh, amount of time is the uh, independent. Okay, do y'all agree or disagree? Agree. So here I have two variables temperature and time. Which one's the independent? Time. Which one's dependent? Since so they're both the letter T, typically what math people do is they'll use temperature as a capital T. So it would be T of lowercase t. T of T would equal uh, something to do with the amount of time. Now, let's just say it's been cooking for five minutes. Does that mean it's going to be five degrees? No. no. So there's going to be some type of multiplier. So maybe the multiplier is times, I don't know, uh, if it's been cooking for five minutes, how long you, or how hot do you think it might be? Just take a guess. If you were to cook something for five minutes, what temperature do you think it might raise to? 100 in here? So five times what gives you 100? 20. Let's just leave make that be our example and answer. So if I cook it for two minutes, maybe it's at 40 degrees. If I cook it for five minutes, at 100. You have to add the temperature. Yeah, you would probably do something like that. Especially, it, it might be that the starting of temperature. So a lot of way that you a lot of times do that is Ti. What do you think that little I stands for? Ti, or they could initial very good, or they could do a T zero. Would also mean let's do a T zero. That would also mean Initial temperature. Initial temperature. There we go. Do you remember when we talked about functions? Nope. How many packets you have them? What are we talking about? Oh, the independent division. That's right. Now, which one was independent? Uh, it's the X, which is a lot of times referred to as domain. So if you're looking at the next blank slide, which is the bottom right slide, Domain, this is the independent variable. 
Typically x, not always. Independent. There we go. Independent. Not a, I'm not an English teacher for a reason. Spelling's not my strong suit. Okay, so that means range is only left to be dependent. dependent, and it's oftentimes referred to as a y. Not always, but oftentimes a y. Okay, so now uh, we're, we're looking at change in tandem. What that just means is as one variable change, as one value changes, the other, the dependent will change based off the independent. So two things will be happening. It won't just be a change of x without a y changing. So uh, we had examples, if you remember. We talked about an iPhone, a bathtub getting filled with water, and a boiler heating up. I know it's been two days, but that's what we were talking about. Specifically, I want to talk about different types of domain. Okay, so on iPhones, when you go to buy an iPhone, you might have different price iPhones based off the memory. Here, there's three examples. There's 16 gigs, 32 gigs, and 64 gigs. Here's my question for you. Would this domain be all reels? Would it be all reels? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, so that means we can have any amount of memory we wanted to buy available to us. If I wanted 16.25 gigs, could I buy a 16.25 gig no, iPhone? No. No, could I buy a 17 gig iPhone? No. No, there's only going to be specific values, so this would not be all reals. So according to this example, what are the three values it could be? 16, 32, 32, and 64. Okay, and you're going to learn about set builder. Uh, as we go on, but I'm going to use uh, often in my class interval notation. And how this would look is if you were doing a domain, you might say bracket, that means it can be equal to, and a 16. Now, if it was a string of numbers, like a, a continuous set of numbers, I would do uh, a comma here, but since it's only one number and then a big jump, you close the bracket. That means it can be equal to 16. I'm going to do U. Do you know what U stands for? Uh, um, in the word, it, uh, technical definition is union. What it means is 16 or. It could be 16 or what? 32. 32. Or, so another one, 64. Now that's called interval notation there. And so that means whenever it's just one number in there, that it's going to be a jump. Okay? Uh, let's go on to the next one. A uh, bathtub. <coughs> That's the domain, by the way. I didn't do the range. I could do the range, but I'm just going to do domain. Uh, on the second example, we talked about a bathtub being filled with water. Here's the question. If it says uh, the domain might possibly be between 0 and 2 gallons per minute, when you turn on your faucet, do you think you could find a spot where it's coming out 1 gallon per minute? Do you think we could figure out where it is at half a gallon per minute? Yes. Yeah. Okay, what about three quarters per minute? Yeah. Yeah, we, we can find anything in between zero. zero and two. So here's how this domain would look different this time. This time, uh, could we turn off the water entirely? No. Yes. Yes, hopefully so, otherwise it's going to leak. Okay, perfect. Uh, good to have you this point. Could I have negative water coming out? No. No. So the smallest number I could ever find, you always go smallest to greatest. I forgot to mention that here. Smallest to greatest. The smallest would be zero. But this time, I could have a, I know I'm going to have to use the word range. I'm not talking about why. I could have a range of values anywhere from zero to two. two. So it would be zero comma two like this. Now, uh, oftentimes you might, well, I'll just leave it like that. That means any value between zero and two is a possibility. Could I come out? Could it be greater than two? No. No, our faucets are limited. They, they can't just keep pouring out more and more water. Our last one, the broiler function. Uh, I remember we had a broiler that was getting hot. Uh, it might have a domain between zero and infinity. What it was, in fact, let me go back. We said the temperature depends on how much time it's been cooking. Okay, could I cook something for a negative amount of time? No. Could I cook it? Uh, for five minutes, yes. yeah, for seven point two minutes, yes. or three point one four one five six, you know, five minutes. Yeah. yeah, could I cook it for two hours? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no limit. That's what the infinity means. Just keep on going. There's no limit on the domain. So here's how you'd write that: the minimum amount of cooking would be zero minutes, but I could cook anywhere up to infinity. infinity. Now, infinity is that a real number or more of an idea to an idea. represent something? Because it's an idea, you can't be equal to an idea. So get this. Uh, I am an extremely wealthy man. I'm a school teacher. 
All right, so if you go to my bank and you said, show me his checking account, they would actually just show an infinity symbol next to my account because I have so much money. Now, would that be true? No. I mean, even if Mark Zuckerberg, owner of Facebook, walked in, would that be true of him? No. No, you can't have infinite. That's the idea. It's not real. Because it's not real, it's going to be a privacy. That means you can't actually equal it. You cannot equal a bank account or infinite money. Okay, there's always some type of limitation. Questions over domain? No. Now, I didn't hit range. The only thing different with range is it's the output. But the same type of symbols. All right, so I'm going to let you try real quick here. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. I want you to think through on example A here. I want you to determine which one you think is the domain. I'm going to do a countdown. I even want you to say the blue or the red. Okay. Five. Four, three, two, one. Blue. 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 blue is correct. So now let me show you how you write this. Do what I have included here a three? Yeah. Do I have a four? Yeah. Yes. Do I have a 3.5? No. Anything in between? No. no. So this would be a domain where we would have to do that bracket on three. And since there's nothing, not a 3.1, there's not a 2.9, I would have a closed bracket just around there. And then what was the symbol that we did next to say there's another one? Uh, the union symbol. Union. So it could be three or four, four, four or five, five, four. Whoops, I messed up. How did I mess up? <laughs> and what does a parenthesis mean? Mean? Yeah, it means it can get really close, but it actually will never equal five. Okay. And what about one more? Eight. Eight. All right, you got it. That's the domain. And this one we'll go ahead and put the range since it's easy to see. We don't have to scan the whole problem for it. The range would be the red. Let me show you color coordinated. Oops. See if I can do this real fast. Let's color coordinate here. We'll go here. Oh, I gotta get closer. Uh, properties. And this looks like it's blue from back in the classroom. There it is. Smart word. Okay. Uh, range, our range values. You always go smallest to biggest. If I did not say that earlier, so the domain is in order. Is the range also in order? Yes. yes. All right. So we start with negative eight. Union. What comes next? Nine. Nine. Union. Eleven. Eleven. Union and fifteen. Fifteen. You got it. Okay. What about this table? I'm gonna let you try. I'll give you, uh, I don't know, say a minute. Come up what you think the domain range should be for part B. No cheating if you're streaming, because I wanna start writing them in so I'm not behind, but no cheating. If you look at my board, it should stay the same. Show of hands, how many people have written down what they think the answer might be? All right. Here's what it should look like. Or you tell me, what'd you do for domain? So, how many different intervals do you have written down? Three. Three with two unions in between? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. What about the range? One. One. Just one. Perfect. There it is. If you got that, you got the right answer. This would be called a constant function. <clears throat> constant function uh, just means you're getting the same constant output no matter what. What's the output every time? Three. three. It doesn't matter what goes in, what comes out is a three. We call that a constant function. I'm going to add that little vocabulary. I'm going to do a little star. That means it's not necessarily about this problem. It's just that this is a constant function. That just means that your output is constant no matter what your input is. If it was a set pattern, it might be linear, it might be quadratic, it might be exponential, all those functions you learned in other classes. But if it's one output, we call that constant. All right, I have a graph for you to look at. Let's take a look at this graph. 
It says use the graph of f, and if you're wondering what is f, that's this graph right here. I'm going to put a little f on there. Use the graph of f to find the domain and range of the function. Express your answer using set builder and or interval notation. Now, I will get to set builder this time around. I haven't done it yet. So this time I'm going to put d way up here. I'll put range down here because I'm going to write it twice. I'm going to show you set builder. So far, I've been working in interval notation. Let's start with domain. What does domain refer to typically? The x values or the y values? X. x values. Okay, so you're looking, and the question to ask yourself when you're looking at a graph is how far to the left, as you start with the small numbers, left, how far to the left would this graph travel? It would go on and on and on. It continues more and more left. Now, it goes more left or more down? Down. But does that mean it stops going left? No, no, no. no, it continues on to the left. For that reason, it would go left further and further. So I'm going to put a negative infinity there. So when you go up here for the interval, can I actually be equal to negative infinity? No. 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 And that's why it's in the arrow. It's saying it's heading there, but it's not actually a solid point. A solid point means it equals it. Arrow means it's going there. So I go left negative infinity. Now, follow the line. I'm going to use a vocabulary word here. Is it continuous or is it break? Break. Discontinuous means break. Does, is this continuous graph or does it break? Break. Where does it break? At three. Uh, okay, okay, sorry. Does it break in the middle? No. Before the endpoint. Okay, so it's a continuous graph, so I go all the way to the endpoint. Now, what's the x value here? Three. I agree. Three. If we're counting by one. So let's just put that on there. Since they didn't count here, I'm going to say one, two, three. Good, it goes to three. Now, this is a closed dot. At end point, does that mean it equals it or does not equal it? It's a bracket. Now in set builder notation, let me show you set builder. We just do here S B for set builder. What you do for that is they do this squiggly bracket. I'm sure you've seen it on your keyboard. You very rarely use it, probably. I'm sure you've seen that before. You use that squiggly bracket. And then you say you state the letter of what you're doing. Now, if we're doing domain, what letter are we using? Oh, sorry. Uh, what variable? X. There we go. X, and then they do a vertical line. That means I'm about to describe it's such that X, I'm going to describe what X is I can use. With set builder, you never include it in negative infinity. So what I do is I'm going to say that X somehow compares to this 3. Is this 3 the biggest number or the smallest number? Biggest. Biggest. So I'm going to say x is less than or equal to 3. And that equal to is because this was a closed bracket. But you'll never in, uh, include the negative infinity. You just assume that when it says x is less than or equal to 3, that includes all numbers that are smaller. And then once you're done, you close the bracket. Or actually, sorry, a lot of times they'll say what type of numbers these are. These are real numbers, x, and it's this uh, weird looking e that you'll see with the double r. And then they'll close the bracket. I'm running out of space. Let me see if I can slide this over so it's outside that green for you. All right, there you go. That's set builder. All right, let's try this one more time, but this time let's look at range. What's different for range? It's the Y values. It's the Y values. In a visual representation, I, you know, if you're watching the video later, you're not going to be able to see this, but I'm going to use my hands up here. Uh, when you're looking at domain, if you need help, what you can think of is domain means which axis? X. If you were to take your hands and smash the graph to the X axis, think of a trash compactor. Have you ever seen those where you throw trash in it and the walls crash in on it? If you smash everything to the X axis, you're thinking, what values of the x-axis would have pieces of graph smashed in? And since this arrow means go on forever, when I smash it all together, it would go forever to the left. But to the right, it would not go forever. Where would it have stopped at? Three. Three. Okay, so now when you do range, can you help? We don't smash to the x-axis. Now where do we smash? To the y. So you're smashing this way. And so if you smash it, how low would that graph travel on the y-axis? Uh, negative. <laughs> Where would we go? To negative two? Is that the lowest it goes? Negative, no, 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 no. negative infinity. See that arrow over here? Yeah. This is actually going to be the lowest point. Let's switch colors. So I'm going to do a negative infinity over on the y axis. It goes down forever. So I'll first do interval. Can I be equal to negative infinity? No. So parentheses. Now, we already said, stated, this graph is 
continuous. There's no breaks. So now what you do is you don't go to the end point. You go to the highest point. That's one of the hardest things with range is we do the domain from left to right, but range is bottom to top. And it doesn't matter the endpoints. The top might not be the endpoint, unlike with domain. So the top is here. How high is that? Two. I'm going to put a y axis so we can say it's two. Now, this does not have a dot, but the line. Is the line solid or dashed there? Solid. solid. Because of that, it means it's a solid dot if you want to add that. And so I'm going to do a bracket. So there's a range. Let's write it in set builder now. This time, what variable are we working with? Y. Y, and then you do a vertical line. That means Y such that, meaning I'm about to describe the Ys. The Y has to, do I write the negative infinity? Yeah. No. No, but I do write the two. Am I bigger than two or smaller than two? Smaller. Smaller, or I should have said smaller than or equal to. Yep. Two, comma. Y can be any real number. <clears throat> what that means is there, it's not like a break in only the whole numbers. I could be the decimals in between. I could be a square root in between, all that stuff. All right. Questions on C? Spend their time there. All right. So to find domain algebraically, here's the fun stuff. Now, uh, I wish I could point in my room. I have turned it in last week, a laminated version of this. Uh, I call it the three commandments of math. There are three things in math you cannot do. You ready for this? Very, very important that you get this down. I mean, it's extremely important. Number one, are you allowed to divide by zero? No. No. You cannot divide by a zero. Here's how I will represent that. It doesn't matter if I put a one there or a ten there or a thousand there. What matters is on the bottom, your x value cannot equal zero in the bottom of a fraction in the denominator. Secondly, with the square root, you cannot be negative number. So the symbols for that is that it's greater than or equal to zero. It could be a neutral number zero, or it could be positive. And that's with an even root. What that means is you could have an uh, odd root. I'll put a little three there. That's what cancels a cube. And that could be negative, but any even power root, so whether it's a square root, which cancels a square, or a fourth root or an eighth root, it, can't, it cannot be negative on the inside. And finally, one you will not see for a while, but we will see it, uh, I think basically October-ish, is taking a log of a non-positive number. When that comes up later, I'll, I'll go more in detail. These are the two I need you to do today. What you know how to do, first off? Secondly? Take an even root of a negative number. Can't take a root, an even root of a negative number. Okay. So let's look at, uh, and by the way, down here, this is telling you we will focus on the log, but not today. So don't stress on that today. That's a problem for another day. Okay, well, let's look at the example three here. So determine the domain range of these functions. State your answers in interval notation. All right, so what you look for is you assume a function is all reals unless you see a rule breaker. So question for you. When you look at the first function, do we have any division going on? No. no. It's not by, do you see a square root? No. no. We don't even have to draft this. The domain will be all reals. The domain would be all reals. If you just say XPR, XC double, that double R, why did I not have to graph it? Because there's no number next to the It's not because there's not a number next to the X. There could be a number here, like three or whatever. It's still be the same answer. That's fine. Because what I'm trying to get through is math works on rules. And math always works unless you break a rule. How many rules are there? Three. Three. And did we break any of those three rules? No. No. We don't have those involved in the equation. That means it's going to be all reals. Math always works unless you break one of the commandments. Okay, let's try the next one. Do you here see a division? No. No division. Do you see a square root? Yes. That's called a square. Oh. No. 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 no, no. No, no square root, no fourth root, no eighth root, anything no. like that. Uh, do you see a log? No. no. I mean, it's all reals. If you graph that, what does this graph look like? It's a, it's a parabola. So if you graphed it, it would be a parabola. It goes on forever both ways. 
this is all reals because it never stops going either direction. What would this graph look like? A lady. It's a line. line. Yeah. yeah. And the slope, if it doesn't have a number, what's the slope? One. And this would be the y-intercept. So you could just draw a line like this, just up one unit. There you go. So yes, those would be all reals. Well, we didn't have to do that because I'm teaching you the algebra. Teaching you the, the method behind the madness and that. Yeah, that's the algebra. Okay. Can I go on, y'all? Yes. Cool. If I go to the next slide, all right. C, will this be all reals? No. 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 What do you see? It breaks the, the square root. Second. What's the rules with square roots? Can't be zero, can't be negative, or it has to be positive. It can't be negative. It cannot be negative. So here's what you do. You pull only what's on the inside of the square root. So you could have had other numbers on the outside, you'd ignore them. You only pull the numbers inside the square root. These will be the rule-breaking portion. And you say this number, if x minus 4, has to be either positive or equal to zero. It cannot be negative. So the symbol for that is x is greater than or equal to zero. And now you do algebra 1, or depending on the problem, you might have to do algebra 2, to solve for your variable. So how do I get x isolated? That means by itself. Oh, so you add 4 because the rule of math is you do the opposites. When you're solving for a variable, you do the opposite of what you see. What's the opposite of subtraction? Addition. Addition. So we add. And just like that, we have our domain. Once x is isolated, we know our domain. x has to be greater than or equal to 4. four. Now this is close to uh, set builder. You know, with set builder, all you would do differently is you would uh, throw this little squiggly there and do x such that, and then comma, x can be any other real number. It's just x has to be greater than or equal to 4. That's set builder right there. But this did not, if you go back, I'm going to go back. It's just three seconds. I'm going to go backwards and forward. Our instructions stated here to write the answer in interval. interval. So I'm going to change it to interval. As an interval, you use parentheses and brackets. You never include it infinity. Is four the biggest number or the smallest number? Ooh, smallest. This is saying x is greater than or equal to four. Four is the small number. So this time you would do a uh, uh, bracket or parenthesis? Uh, right. bracket. bracket. And then an interval, you do have to include the infinity. So it's got to be greater than or equal to 4. That means 4 to infinity would work. Let's see if I can. There we go. And bracket or parenthesis over here. Parenthesis. Parenthesis. There's your domain. If you wanted to graph it, I'm running out of space. If you wanted to graph this, I'm going to do a small graph. What a square root looks like is just go over four units, one, two, three, four, and what a square root does is it curves up to the right like that. That's what a square root looks like. So go four units and then just curves up to the right. You could always type that in the calculator, but for the time being, I'm just going to tell you that's what the graph would look like. Notice it's not on the left side, it starts with four, goes forever to the right. All right, your turn. Tell me about D. What do you notice about D? There's division. Is that a rule breaker? No, no. Okay. Yeah, division. Is there some a way we could break the rules with division? Let me ask the question that way. Yeah. Yes. What do you know about the divide by? Zero. Zero. So as soon as you see a division and you take the variable underneath, here's how it works again. You take the variable that's underneath. Let me do it this time. You take that variable and you say x cannot equal zero. That's a symbol. That means it cannot equal zero. And you solve from there. Well, lucky us. Is there anything to actually solve here? No. 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 So we're done. So I'll, just to make sure you're not confusing your math, I want to do it just below. If you were writing in the set builder, you would say x such that x cannot equal zero, x e r. That means x can be any value other than zero. zero. Now, how does this work in interval notation? Interval notation does not have a does not equal symbol. So here's what you would do. With interval, you do you say, instead of what is it not equal, you would state what it does equal. What can x be? What's the smallest number x could be? One. Oh, not one. Zero. 
I heard someone in the up in the far left of my classroom say it. Start with a negative round rhymed with infinity. Negative infinity. Negative infinity. It goes from negative infinity all the way up to what value? There's gonna be a break. Oh, you say negative one, it can actually be negative point five. Negative point two five. What you're gonna do is this, you're gonna put a zero, but can I actually equal zero? No. no. That means all the negative numbers. Now, but I can do positive numbers as well. So what do you think I need to do next? Or the, or the union. Or positive numbers. So parentheses around zero all the way to positive thing. That's how you write that in an integral. So set builder, you can write what x is greater than or equal to, you can write what x is not equal to. Interval, you only put what x is equal to, what it can, the values it can be. But that's how you write that. If you want to add a quick graph, uh, I'm going to do it up here. The graph of this, I call it a C graph, C curves. But it, you'll have a C curve in the first quadrant, like this. And you'll have another C curve in the third quadrant, like that. That's what the graph would look like. Notice it would be broken when x is zero. In the center of the graph, there's a break. Are you good for me to change? Okay. Got a couple more. I right, increase the difficulty as we go here. So far, I've only shown you algebra one difficulty using the pre-cal algebra. Now let's go jump into algebra two difficulty. All right, when you look at this problem, what's the potential rule breaker in this problem? Um, dividing by zero. Dividing. You're not allowed to divide by zero. So you only take the denominator. All we're concerned with is the denominator. So I'm going to say x squared plus x. Minus six cannot equal zero. And I need to solve this. Now, how in the world do I solve when I have not just a power on the x, but multiple x's of different power? Can't combine the x's together. And I'm not going to be able to solve by square root because that would just square root this x, which doesn't get me anywhere. Subtract. You learn this now for two as the zero product property. Whenever you have multiple, let's, I'll call it multiple variables, or you can say the same variable of multiple powers. You have to solve by factoring. So I do what's called x method factoring. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw an x over here. Oh. And I'm going to take the factors of a times c. Now you're like, what is a times c? Well, a it's is the coefficient in front of the x squared. B is the coefficient in front of the x, and C is the number all on its own. What is my A value if it doesn't show me a number here? One. So what's one times negative six? Negative six. Now that goes there. Secondly, you put place the B value down at the bottom of the x. So in this case, again, it's blank. So what number? One. That's a one there, so I'm just sneak in a one. So I put a one there. Now your goal, uh, and again, I have this coming in laminated form, but it just hasn't been done yet in the proper room. You're looking for two numbers, I'm going to call them m and n, that multiply to be negative 6, but when you add them together, become a 1. That means they have a product of negative 6, but a sum of 1. What two numbers can you think of that multiply? Three and negative 2. Okay, y'all went all the way to the negative. A lot of times what I was about to say is what can multiply to be 6 and either add or subtract to be 1? Could it be 1 and 6? No. No, because they would not add or subtract to be 1. Could it be 3 and 2? Yeah. Okay, so here's how I do I always start with the positives, and I just put the positives. And then I figure out the subtraction. What do I need to subtract to make it equal 1? 3 minus 2. Now check it. Is 3 times negative 2 negative 6? Yeah. You found our numbers. Now this problem has a shortcut. What you would next do is your next step is you break this power and you place it in front of C. So if you break this power in half, what's half of two or two divided by two? One. one. So you would have a one x here. You would have a just one x there. 
Then you place the three. And then you do the other half, 1x there, minus 2. Now, if your a is bigger than 1, there's going to be one more step of simplifying, but this one doesn't have it, so I'm just going to leave it like that. And you say this does not equal 0. So, this right here is the same value. What I have just wrote down here, factored form, is exactly the same as the blue. They look different, but this is as factors. You can check it out real quick if we do this instead of distribution. If we foil this out, if you all heard foil before now for 2, you remember that? You would go x times x. What's x times x? x squared. What's x times negative 2? Negative 2x, two which doesn't look right what it's supposed to, but that's because you'd also have a 3 times x. What's 3 times x? 3x. So you'd have a 3x and a negative 2x. Combine those together. 3x minus 2x is 1x, and then 3 times negative 2. Negative 6. So what we did is we took the blue and we rewrote it as a black. Now, why did we do this? Because in math, we know when you multiply and you want to, in this case, not equal zero, but I'm just going to, for the sake of time, equal zero. What's the only way to multiply and ever get a product of zero? Zero. You sure? Let's test it. What's five times one? Five. What's five times five? Twenty-five. What's five times negative one? Maybe that's it. Negative five. Five times negative five? Negative five. Five times one fifth? Uh, zero. One. How can I multiply five and ever get zero? I have, zero. I have to multiply by zero. So you learn this in algebra two. This is called the zero product property. If you factor an equation and set it equal to zero, or in our case, not equal to zero, what I can do, I'm going to do ZPP. All right, right here, ZPP. ZPP. That stands for zero product property. It states that you can separate each one. The only way to take x plus 3 and make it multiply and get 0 is I have to multiply by 0. The only way to take x minus 2 and multiply and get 0 is that it would have to be multiplied by 0. So you separate the two. You say x plus 3 cannot equal 0, and x minus 2 cannot equal 0. And now we'll solve from there. Uh, what's our step of algebra here? Uh, minus, three. minus three. So that's the opposite. That was being added by three, so I'm subtracting three. I'm left with x cannot equal three. negative three. And then what about over here? What's the opposite of subtracting two? Just add two. Add two. So x cannot equal zero two. Oh. So I've run out of room for my interval notation, so I'm not going to write this with an interval notation. What I will do is I'll just put it together. I'll say x cannot equal, you do the smaller number first. Which one's smaller? Negative 3. Negative 3 and 2. I'm just going to write it like this. This is called as a inequality. It's almost set builder. Set builder, you need to include the x such that and then a comma xer. But that's just called an inequality. I'm going to leave it as an inequality because I've run out of space, frankly. All right, part F, and then we'll move on. Do we have any rules going on here? Uh, you cannot divide by zero. So what's in the denominator cannot equal zero. Is that the only rule? No. Square root. What does square root eliminate? Negatives. Negatives. So let me come back here. A square root takes away the negatives, meaning it can only be positive or zero. But the division takes away zero. zero. So on a number line, if you look at it as a number line, you have uh, a zero number, you have negative numbers, and you have positive numbers. What's going to happen is the square root is going to eliminate the negatives. The division is going to eliminate zero. What's the only type of number left? Positive. Positives. So if you need to write that down here, I'm going to go up above and say, oops, wrong problem, here. I'm going to go right here, and I'm going to draw the same number line up above F, and I'm going to put a zero here, a negative, and a positive. And I'm going to put this note saying, here, that is eliminated because of the square root. And this is eliminated because of the division. That's a division symbol. It's hard to see. So what's the only type of number left over? Positive. Awesome. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say 4 
minus 7x has to be greater than 0. As you can see how I got there? How did I get to this symbol? It's because the division eliminated what type of numbers? Zero. We cannot equal the neutral number of zero. And the square root says you cannot be negative. So what's the only type of number left over? Positive. And so that's why I just say this value has to be greater than zero. All right, let's solve for algebra. How do you want to solve this? There are two ways we can do this. What do you want to do? We can solve for x. Yeah, how do I isolate this x? I don't have to factor because I only have this one value of x. I don't have to worry about factoring. Add 7x. Okay, you could add 7x to both sides. That's one way of doing it. So now I have 4 is greater than 7x. Divide by 0. Good, and divide by 7. Because what's 7 doing to the x? It's multiplying. What's the opposite of multiplication? Division. Division. That's why we divide by 7. 4 over 7 is greater than x. Yep, and I'm going to write the x first. So I'm going to say x is less than good. you got to turn my turn it around, i got to turn everything around. So x is less than 4 over 7. And I'm going to leave it as an inequality again. Domain, algebraically, there it was. Y'all ready to look at a new topic? No. No. Not yet? No. <laughs> no. We got more to go. Damn. So that was domain, algebraically. Before I move on, quick quiz. There are three things you're not allowed to do in math. Oh, okay. What's number one? Three. Two. One, you can't divide by zero. cannot divide by zero. Good. Number two, three, two, one. An even root cannot be negative in the inside. All right, good. And finally, the third rule that you won't see for a little while anyways. Three, two, one. The inside of the log must be positive. And the way of saying that is it has to be a non-negative no, it, it cannot be a non-negative number. Non -negative number. Sorry, non -negative. I'm getting you confused. Don't worry, I'll get it right by the time I got to get my book out of there right. All right, let's talk about Williams tests for a function. You should know some of these. What are some ways to know if something's a function? Uh, the line. Ah, what type of line test? Uh, Good, Jonathan. It was the vertical. Vertical line test. Good. That's one. A horizontal line test we'll do, we'll do later. That's for uh, inverse is a function. So that's one, the vertical line test. The rule is with a function is that for every x value, there must be one and only one y value in the range. So here it is. In a function, every x in the domain, there can be one and only one y in the range. And so a vertical line test is the way to test a graph. That tests a graph. But not everything's in a graph. So I'm actually going to start with things that are not in a graph. I'll let you see these. OK? Scenario one. Suppose in a school, a locker is given to every student. So here's a list of students, and they each have lockers. We have a function that could describe the figure below. John Smith gets locker one, Mary Jones, locker two, and so on. The domain in X is the set of students. This is our domain. So I'll put an X column right here. This would become the Y. Here's the question. And I'm, you can read this over later. Again, I don't always read all the paragraphs. It's, I'm assuming a lot of you can read, so I'm just going to describe the problem. Here's my question for you. Would every single x have one and only one y? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so this is a function. Why is it a function? 
Because each x has one and one. Each x has one and only one y. One y. Yeah, okay, scenario two. Let's look at this scenario. Again, x's are here, y's are here. Does each x have one and only one y? No. no. Ah, you think so, but they do. John has how many y's attached to him? One. 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 Mary has how many y's attached to, attached to her? One. one. Anna has how many y's attached to her? One. one. Ted has how many y's attached to him? One. 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 It doesn't matter that they share the y. They each, each x has one and only one y. Function. This is a function. Yes. But you might want to note this is tricky. This is tricky. Why is it tricky? There's two additions in one. That's right. Which means uh, I heard someone earlier say that a horizontal line test, this would fail the horizontal line test. The horizontal line test means would it be a function if you went backwards? Would this be a function going backwards? No, no. No, because locker three. These two, this one y would have how many x's? Two. Okay, so it would not be a function backwards. That's, uh, so we'll get to that later in here. Okay, let's talk about this one. What do you think? Oh, let's make our notes. This is x. Not a function. Here, not a function. Why? Because an x shares two y. Which x? Uh, 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 Anna, lucky girl, blows this up. She gets two lockers. I mean, talk about the way of having two boyfriends. Listen, I'll meet you at my <laughs> locker. She meet me at 2.14 and then in a different period. Hey, sorry, I got to run. I got to get to T-Building. And she's like secretly meeting someone uh, at in G-Building's locker. Yeah, right? so that's the way to cheat right there. Get yourself two lockers. Uh, you did not hear that here. Uh, anyways, that's not a function. Why? Anna has two lockers. That's the problem. One X has two Y's. All right. And I believe I have one more scenario using lockers here. I'm going to let you think on this one while I just write out the stuff. So I'm going to do a countdown. It's either a function or not a function. Five, four, three, two, one. Function. Ooh, I hear the split. Does every X have one Y and only one Y? Yeah. No. Ted has None. no Ys. So not a function. Ted. Does not have a locker. Poor guy. Some people date two people, some don't get it. I don't know how I went from lockers to boyfriend girlfriends, but I did that. All right. Uh, okay, so there's function going off of a table, if you will. Now the two circles. This looks like mapping. Right, I thought it looks like this is called mapping. What I meant to say is it looks like the old pros and cons. Should I date them? Should I not? Pro con, right? This looks like one of those. This is called mapping in math. So the first circle is always your domain. I'm just going to put domain here. The second circle represents the range whenever you do this. You always go in that order domain to range. So check out your domain here. Does each domain have one and only one y? Yes. All right, this is a function. Good. Moving on to part B here. Does each domain have one and only one member of the range? Yes. Yes, this is also a function. Good, y'all. We're not tricked this time. Uh, would this would its inverse be a function though? No. The inverse no. means going backwards. No. no. No, that would fail that way. All right, what about this one? Not is one this a function? Yes. 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 No. Oh, no. No. Yes. Not a function. What's the problem? 30 doesn't have no y. Oh. Yeah. 30 has no y. Uh, put that parentheses. 30 has no y. Okay. That's not proper English. But 
has no y. There it is. Okay, what about this one? No, no, no. no. What's the problem this time? 30 has 30 30 has two. All right, so 30 has two y's. You can write that in if you want. They all were, since you all basically said not a function, I'm not going to spend the time right now. But if you want to, that's the problem. The problem was 30, it has two y's. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at it this way. Is this set of domain and range? Which one's the domain? Uh, first number. X. So let's see here. Does this appear to be a function here? No. Y'all no. no. are quick. What's the problem? The y is two ah, Six is used not one time, but twice. 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 And what does it generate? Two different y's. Six has two. Let me say unique. Two unique y values. So function or not a function? Not a function. Not a function. Very good, class. Very good. All right, what about f? Function. Function. Each x has a unique y, and the x's don't repeat. So this is a function. Hold on. All right, now here comes the vertical line test. So the vertical line test is used for a, what's that word say? A graph. a graph. And what it does is a vertical line allow you to see the x values and where they're getting the y. Okay, so I have a line down here that I'm going to use. I'll uh, use this one. And I'm going to pass it through. I want you to tell me if this ever hits this graph more than one location. You can use your pencil on your packet. But as I slide this through here, does this vertical line ever hit that problem more than one location at any one time? No. That's a function then. This would be a function. You can use your pencil on your packet. You can just, like I did with this vertical line, you can just use your pencil and cross the parabola. And it doesn't ever hit more than one location. Okay, what about this parabola? No. Yes. No. This one fails the vertical line test. Since it fails, we'd say it is not a function. Not a function. I'll go a different color. Not a function. This one fails the vertical line test. And maybe you want to put like uh, two X's that are vertically stacked so you remember later. Or you can just draw a line to your packet. Maybe I'll just get a second line. That way I can do that one there. Okay. And. Uh, I lost my line. There it is. Okay. This time, what do you think? Oops. Function. Oh. Function? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a function. Good job. I'm going to try something. Let's see here. To make it a little easier. Okay. All right, what about D here? Function, not a function. What do you think? Uh, function. function. All right, that's a function. What about this one? Yeah. What about this one? No. no. Now, this is tricky here. Uh, it's hard to tell. Is that a closed circle or open circle? Look at your packet. Closed. 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 Now let's talk about this one. Open, open closed. closed. Open. Okay. I'm going to go back to an illustration I used earlier. Let's go ahead and put function. Function. And now the illustration I used earlier when I was doing domain and range, I said think of like a trash compactor. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're focusing a vertical line test. Do you really focus on the x's or the y's? What's the important thing here? Yes. The x's. So I'm going to smash to the x-axis. If you smashed to the x-axis at the origin, if I'm, so I'm smashing this graph to the x-axis, would I have trash on top of trash? No. Or to be trash on top of empty space? Trash on top of empty space. If this is the trash and that's the empty space, when they smash together, it would be trash on top of empty space. Mm -hmm. That would be a function because it's not trash on top of trash. 
Does that make sense? So a closed circle and an open, when they combine together, it just becomes one little closed dot. It's like one consistent piece. When we do domain, here's, let's go ahead and write this in. This will be helpful for you. Go ahead and put function in. When we do domain here, you would not break that on the domain. Let's say this is negative 1, 2, negative 3, negative 4. This is negative 5. Go ahead and put a negative 5 there. And then this would be 1, 2, 3, 4. This is 5 here. For the domain, how far left does this graph travel? Negative 5. It's an open circle. Is that a parenthesis or bracket? If it's a open circle, you do a parenthesis. Five. Now, you, if I asked the question I asked earlier, I said, is it one continuous piece or is it discontinuous? The answer should be this is discontinuous. But for domain purposes, when you smash these together, they become one continuous piece. So you're not even going to break the zero. This domain would go from negative five to five. Close out or. Uh, All right. So let's now move on. New topic here. Any questions before I move on? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's talk about how we can express functions. It says here the input and output values of a function vary in tandem, meaning they work together. The input determines the output, they change. This rule can be expressed in four different ways verbally, analytically, numerically, or graphically. It says typically we start with verbal, that means like a word problem, or analytical, which means it's just like a normal uh, math problem, and we generate the others. And it says sometimes we might work the other direction, which is oftentimes harder. But each method has its strengths and weaknesses, and that's why we're going to use all four. So here's verbally. It says we can use words to describe the relationship. Now, that's the models, you usually start with a verbal description of the function. Older brother Steve receives two dollars more allowance than Tom. Now, if you want to write this as an equation, what we typically do is, how I do is, I'd start with what uh, might be variables or where's the equal sign. So in this place, in this problem, what do you think refers to the equal sign? More. Not more. I'll tell you what more is. Yeah. Said. X plus. Receives. It receives. This right here is going to take the place of our equals. Oh, where? Oh. Older brother Steve receives. That means equals. Now, what's going to be the variable over here? Older brother or Steve? Steve. Steve. So I'm going to use an S. Steve equals $2. Now, that's easy. That's a number. It's going to be a 2. More. What does more mean? Does, that Does more mean no. add, subtract, multiply, add. divide, square, cube? Add. 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 Cube. add. It means, yeah, more means add. Now, when you see the word van, then this is an interesting word. This usually means switch the order. When you see the word van, switch order. So what does that mean? Instead of saying 2 plus T for Tom, instead of doing 2 plus T, you see a van, you switch the word. Now, in this problem, it doesn't matter. But I'm going to say equals t plus 2. So Steve is Tom plus 2. Whatever Tom gets, Steve gets $2 more. Now, this would be analytical. That's analytical right there. Now, as we were working that through, you might not have noticed, but your very next slide gives us the same thing. It says analytical. Uh, there we go. Analytically, using an equation. So if x is Tom's allowance, y is Steve's allowance, and y is Steve's. So this is Steve. Did we have s equals t plus 2? Is that how we wrote it? Yes. Now look, they did the same thing. They said x is Tom. And y is Steve. And then they changed to f of x. That's actually not the best math. I should have done it that way. Uh, let me go ahead and put which equals f of x. Let's go ahead and do that. Because so y equals f of x. The analytical representation above, the name of the function f, the independent 
the, uh, it has an independent variable of x, and the dependent variable is the f of x. That's because y equals f of x. All right. Now, numerically, so numerically is a set of x and y shown often as a table. And notice they just put some examples down there. They said, well, if Tom earns three, what would Steve get? Five. Five. If Tom earned five, Steve would get seven. seven. Eight would receive ten, ten fifteen, sixteen, and so on. It can also be represented, as you've seen today, in this format, where this would be the domain. That would be Tom. This would be Tom. And this would be Steve. Steve. So there's numerically. Finally, there's one more. What was the other one? There was verbal, analytical, numerical, graph. graph. Graphically. And so notice we're starting where on the y-axis? Zero. Two. At two. So this right here, if who starts at two? If someone got zero, the other person gets two. Uh, Tom got oh. zero. Okay, so this would be Tom here, and this would be Steve on the y-axis. So that's four different representations of the same thing. We started with the word problem. We started verbally. We wrote the equation here. We did it together. I just wanted to do that. But then it was given to you as analytical. There's numerically as a table or a set of values. And then graphically. Example five, suppose a market sells deli cheese at $6 a pound, but because of shortages, a customer is restricted to only five pounds. So this is what type of uh, problem right here? That's verbal. So I'll put verbal over here. This is verbal. It says write numerical, analytical, graphic, and a representation of this scenario. Okay, what is happening on the phone? How do we figure this out? What's the independent variable? The, um, like, okay, so if you go to the store, what's the thing that's going to be changing? Oh, the pound. Pound. You might say, I want one pound, I want half a pound, I want three pounds. Pound's going to be our independent. We're going to say this is right. This might help us out. Now, um, this $6, it's going to add to that X. What's it going to do? Multiply. It's going to multiply. Good. So we're going to have $6 times X. So what's that going to equal? The cost. Now, this does never say cost, does it? This is telling you the product. So I'm going to use, we can use C for cheese or for cost. So let's just say here, which means the equals is the word at. That at is the equals. So we're going to say C equals 6x. Is that okay? Now, what is this restriction to only five pounds? It's the independent value, right? This, so could you buy 10 pounds? No. Could you buy 2 pounds? Yes. Could you buy negative 3 pounds? You can't buy negative 3 pounds. It's telling you the domain. Our domain, what's the smallest amount we could buy? Zero. Zero. What's the most, and what's the most we could buy? Five. Five. And we could buy five, so it would be a bracket. Now from there, we could also find a range. You plug in your domain values, and you can find, since this is linear, if I plug in my smallest and largest, I should get my answer because it's linear. Now, it would be different if it was quadratic. You might have to think a little bit more. But if you plug in zero, this is going to be a constant function. Uh, this is the, what type of, uh, who did we just do right here? Uh, sorry. Analytical. No, it's very good. Uh, there's the analytical. Um, before I do the numeric here in a second, I'm going to do graph here. This is a linear function. What's the y-intercept? Five. No. Nope. If you bought zero, plug in a zero, what's six times zero? Zero. 
It's going to start at zero. Strictly increasing and 
from here to infinity. What's the graph doing between there? Increasing. Only increasing. So that would be strictly increasing if for a period it's only going up. Unlike over here, remember this part, though it did increase, it had a part where it was constant. So this is just increasing, this is strictly increasing. Okay, what about this one? What's going on from left to right? It's going up. It's increasing. Is it only increasing though? No. No, no there's some. So would it be strictly or just increasing? Just increasing. Just increasing. And finally, this one. It's strictly increasing. Okay, next slide describes. Oh, sorry, I have examples I want to show you. This one will show you decreasing. Okay, and they'll be the same rules. So suppose you were hiking up a steep hill with several flat sections. I'm going to pause. Would that be increasing or, de or strictly increasing? Increasing. increasing? Only increasing. There you go. Let's just circle that up. Part B. Suppose you are purchasing deli meat at $8 a pound. Why strictly? Because there's no, there's no stop. It's like boom. So if it's one pound, you pay eight. 1.1 pounds, you pay 8.8. .8. Yeah, very good, very good. So this would be strictly, strictly increasing. All right, uh, so here's decreasing. You can read this over it if you like. Just remember, make sense of the symbols. If you're reading through this, like, what does this mean? Just remember that y equals f of x. So when you see this symbol, it's talking about a y. When you see these symbols, it's talking about the x's. Okay, uh, let's look at these. For each function, determine the open intervals on which the function is either increasing, decreasing, or constant. So we would need to graph, and I want to make sure we get through this. This was a long slice never. So I'm going to just kind of give you the graph. Y'all you, know what a cube graph will look like? Yeah. Nobody? Uh, is it the two? Uh, it's an S curve. Yeah. It's going to look like this. Multiplying by three just means it's uh, vertically stretched. So it would look like this. So tell me, what's this graph doing? You only look left to right for increase, decrease. Increasing. It's increasing. Is it ever not increasing? No. So we would say it is strictly increasing, strictly increasing on its domain. Strictly, strictly increasing. And I'm just going to say from uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. From left to right, it's strictly increasing. Next graph, it's squared. What does it mean for a graph if it's squared? What will it look like picture-wise? You should know what a squared looks like. What shape is a squared graph? Parabola. Parabola. This minus 4 on the inside, that means it's going to change the x's. X's, you're going to hear me say a lot this year, are liars. What that means is it does not go, you would think that saying subtract 4 from the x's, it's going to lie, and it's going to go to the right. Your x's, this is why you dump your x's. Your x's are always lying to you, your y's tell you the truth, that's why you marry them. So your x's are liars. So instead of going to negative 4, you go to positive 4 on this parabola. And multiplying it by negative 5 means the graph will be a parabola going down. And it'll be really narrow because it's a negative 5. Actually, that's not very narrow. Let me try again. It would actually go like this, uh, this parabola. OK, tell me about this parabola. What's it doing? So many people say decreasing because, here's the word, it's concave down, meaning it's turning down. It's but it's not actually decreasing the whole time. What's this part of the graph doing? Increasing. Increasing. It increases up to what point? Yeah, it increases. I'm going to do it like this from negative infinity all the way to four. Bracket or parentheses? On increasing, decreasing, does that matter? Because it, it does not. I'm telling you, it does not matter. On, so you can do whichever way you want. Bracket or parentheses. Because technically at that point it's four. It stays constant. So you can use either one. Okay. And it's strictly increasing, by the way. 
Let me say strictly increasing from there to there. And what's it doing from four on? It decreases. So, uh, wow, my pen got really slow. On the one. Here we go. So it is strictly decreasing from where to where? Four to infinity. Four to infinity. Good. All right, I told you earlier. What type of graph is one that has a division? Does it look like? Do you remember? Um, yeah. What does it look like? It's a C. It's a C curve. Very good. Two C curves. Uh, X's. Yeah. Do they lie or tell you the truth? Uh, lie. Right. So do I go to positive three or negative three on the X axis? Negative three. And this would also be really, really narrow. Uh, let me do a negative three. This would be a really narrow one because it gets the y values get multiplied by five. And so it would be just like this C curve there and a C curve here. Whoops. They would follow what's called a vertical asymptote at negative three. That's what that graph's going to look like. Once we learn about graphs, we'll see that's what it looks like. Okay, so what's the <coughs> first part doing? Oh, it looks constant, but you don't have to talk about constant so much. Is it on an increasing portion or decreasing portion? Decreasing, decreasing portion. So we would say it's strictly decreasing uh, because it's actually not constant. It technically is decreasing in there little by little. From where to where? Negative. Negative. Now this time you have to use a parenthesis because does that right even hit three? No. no, there's a break, so you cannot use a bracket. So it absolutely would be wrong. But in, so that's why with increasing, decreasing, I always use parentheses because you'll never be right. Sorry, you'll never be wrong if you use a parenthesis. You could be wrong if you use a bracket. You don't have to. Okay, tell me about the second part. What's it doing? Ah, no, it's not. Decreasing. From left to right, what's happening left to right? Decreasing. It's also decreasing. So you'd say from negative three to infinity. It is, it's strictly decreasing. Yeah, it's decreasing the whole time. It looks like it's flat, but it's technically always getting a little bit smaller. All right. Concavity. Let's finish this lesson up. Yeah, I used that word a second ago. Concave up means it looks like it's turned. Uh, think of a glass of water. When you think of concavity, think glass of water or a cup of water. Is the cup up or down? Up. It's up, so that's concave up. Is the cup up or down? Down. So that's what concave down means. All right, again, partner, for the rest of the teachers, we are still in a hard stop right now. Do not release until we get all of our attendance numbers in. So do not release until you hear the bell. Uh, do not go by the time, go by the bell. All right, if you have not submitted your attendance, please do so now. Okay, now I want you to know something very important. The slope here. The slope, if you went around this parabola, it's always increasing. If it's concave up, slope always increases. You need to write this. This is very important for you. Slope always increases if it's concave up. The slope, I'm not talking about if the function itself is increasing or decreasing. The slope always increases because right now the slope is really negative. You think of slope, remember it's rise over run? Mm -hmm. See this would right here? This part of the slope would be really, really negative. This is still negative, but not quite as negative. Not quite as negative. You see right here? If you were to put a slope on that point, it would be flat. Now it's increasing more, increasing more, increasing more. You see how the slope changes mm -hmm. on this parabola? And it goes from really negative to becoming really positive. The slope always increases if it's concave up. If it's concave down, what happens to my slope? It always decreases. decreases. Always decreases. Slope always decreases. Slope always decreases. This is going to be very important for you, especially next class. Hint, hint. So when does the slope always decrease? Concave down. Concave down. When does the slope always increase? Concave up. Okay. Up increases, down decreases. There you go. 
All right, so an inflection point. What's an inflection point? It's when you change from slow, uh, from concave up to down or vice versa. Change from concave up to concave down or vice versa. Vice versa just means or backwards. Change from concave down to concave up. If you switch, that's called a inflection point. Now, until you get the calculus, it's hard to figure out where that is exactly sometimes. The calculus becomes pretty easy, but you're not there yet. Easy. Right, right. So you see how this is concave? Which one right here? What's that? Down. Concave. concave down. What's this one? Okay. We switch directions. That means there has to be an inflection point in between. All right, I think we are at the end here. Uh, what's happening here? Yeah, so what's this part right here? Concave up. Uh, this is concave up. So what's the slope always doing right here? Increasing. What's this one right here? Concave down. So what's the happening to the slope in between these two inflection points? It's always decreasing. What's this right here? Uh, and what do you call these two points in between? Inflection. Those are the inflection points. You got it. Okay. Uh, zeros. What are zeros? X intercepts. You click here. X intercepts. Or, here's another very important word, solutions. Okay, and now we're going fast to this end. Here's the time I got to, though. Uh, so here, this graph has no zeros because... No x so This has one zero. How many zeros would this have? Two. Four. It's weird how that's blue. And this is infinite because it just continues on hitting, hitting, hitting more zeros. So zeros are very, very important because they are the solutions to equations. Okay, on this one, how many zeros do we have? Two. I mean three. 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 And where are the zeros? You would say x equals one. Negative negative one, one, zero. one. Zero. One zero. One. Three solutions. Three zeros. You got it. It says the approximate, so that's the important thing that you get the x values. Okay. What about here? Just one, one zero, one zero, and where is that zero? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I agree. It said it's x equals five. That would be its answer. 